America's End Times. That's the topic of today's Golden Blunt. And I'm your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events. Is America in its last days of being America? Well, republics, historically speaking, don't last. They don't last forever. Sooner or later, all republics crumble. America so far has defied expectations and defied history in that respect. But look around, look around at what's going on in the nation, the moral decay, the political corruption. Look around what's going on in the world, the hot chaos, the tension points that are drawing America and America's military perhaps into some of these engagements. Look at the leadership in America, Joe Biden, puppet president, being pushed along, steamrolled along by a globalist vision for the world. And you have to ask, what are America's chances for surviving for the next generations, the next singular generation? Good question. My guest today has a lot to say about that point. Before I get into more of that, I want to quickly mention if you like Bold and Blunt, you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app, the online platform for your faith-based podcast at Real Life Network. That is the faith-based news outreach of Pastor Jack Hibbs out in California at WashingtonTimes.com, where you may also subscribe to my three times a week newsletter. Comes out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Contains my commentaries that I write at the Washington Times, along with my Tuesday and Thursday Bold and Blunt podcast. How do you subscribe? It's really easy. Go to WashingtonTimes.com, scroll to the bottom of the page. There's a newsletter section there. Click on it and find my particular newsletter. It's called Bold and Blunt with Cheryl Chumley. You just have to put in your email address and you will be subscribed. It comes out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And one more quick mention, you can get Bold and Blunt, guess what, wherever podcasts are offered. So look around at the state of the nation and I have to ask you, Is the glass half empty or half full for you? Is it optimism you see on the horizon or is it the opposite of optimism? Is it pessimism that you see on the horizon? And really, personally speaking, on any given day, it just fluctuates, right? I'm optimistic because I'm a Christian and I know how the battle is won. And I know where I'll be at the end of the battle. On a pessimistic note, I look around at the nation, at the secular world, and I think, geez, it's amazing that we're still standing at all. America is distinct and special from all other nations in the world, from all other nations in the history of nations of the world, because in America, our rights come from a creator, right? We are born into this concept of freedom that stays with us from cradle to grave, no matter how many regulatory controls the government tries to slam on us, we still rise above because the spirit of freedom, the spirit of liberty is not something that the government gives out or doles out. It's something that comes from God. It's something that comes from above and you just can't kill that spirit. At the same time though, You may not be able to kill that spirit, but you sure can depress that spirit. You can push it away. You can drive it away. You can hide it. You can toss it in a corner, slam it in a box, chain it, chain it in a box and throw it to the bottom of the ocean and make it seem as if that spirit is dead, that that spirit even never was. And that's what's taking place in our public school systems across America right now. If you have kids in public schools right now, they they are rapidly being taught that America, America's best days are behind her. And more than that, America is to blame for all the world's problems right now because America, America is inherently racist. America uh, promotes an unfair, unjust economic system called, coincidentally, the free market. But in the eyes of the left, it has been twisted into something that is an enslaving market where some gain and some lose, and that's unfair. And it's up to the government to 
level the playing field. Well, this is what the coming generation of leaders believe about America. So if you look around at the moral decay in America right now, where blood and gore is entertainment and sex is just something to do for fun, like playing Monopoly, well, let's play Monopoly and get something to eat and have sex and then go out for a, a midnight stroll or something like that. And marriage is archaic and the traditional family is being rapidly torn down, destroyed, stomped on. And if you happen to be one of those Americans who still believe in the traditional family unit of a mother and a father at the head, and then the children being uh, disciplined by parents and not the school system or the government for example, then you are intolerant of this new wave of modern times in America. And so if you look at what's taking place in the culture and how the politics is following the culture, which it always does, which is why Republicans years and years ago missed the boat on failing to get involved in the culture because they thought that it wasn't as important as the politics, well, then you can see that America certainly is headed down some dark, dark, dark times. The darkest being that Americans, by and large, are turning away from God. They are not going to church like they used to. The pews are empty. The faith of Americans is falling. There are too many nuns or those who don't believe in any particular entity above that they are, will one day be accountable to. And so as we grow more and more secular, of course, the light of God, the light of the spirit, the light of liberty darkens, right? It darkens and that opens the door for more of the darkness to come in, which you can define as big, bigger, biggest government. And so this is where we're at in America right now. So I ask you, is the glass half empty or half full? When you look down the road in America, just a few months, just a few years, however you want to qualify that, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic. Well, my guest today, chairman of Citizens for the Republic and a historian, has a lot to say about what's taking place in America and where America's place will be in the world in the coming years, beginning with this very interesting Citizens for the Republic investigation into nuclear power and the funding from nuclear power that is feeding the enemies of Israel and America. Craig Shirley is his name. Craig, thank you so much for being back on Bold and Blunt. You are one of my favorite guests, and I'm so happy you're here again. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. That's very kind. Thank you very much. I love going on your show. Thank you. Well, I love this new piece that you just wrote in conservativehq.org. Big nuclear lines up with enemies of Israel and America. And this is an angle that nobody else has, has covered. Explain what you wrote about what you found. Uh, well, CFTR, as you know, uh, I have to go back to the beginning. CFTR was uh, started by Ronald Reagan uh, after the 1976 campaign with some leftover campaign money. He operated uh, for a couple for about four years. In fact, in '78, it was the largest PAC in America. And then his own campaign committee, Citizens for Reagan, took over in 1980, and CFTR was kind of put on the shelf. And it was there for many, many years, gathering dust and, uh, until I, I I picked it up and dusted it off and reintroduced it. We've been doing. Uh, reform work ever since we we went after Enron and proved to the world that they were they were a corrupt corporation. Uh, as you know, it took us seven years, but uh, they they wanted they they were sponsoring bills to impose uh, federal mandates on the entire country over electricity. Uh, whereas you know every state has its own deal already in place with their uh, with their state you know rate with their state uh, electricity generators whether nuclear or solar or uh, water hydro whatever gasoline oil but they wanted they wanted to supersede that they were pushing a corrupt bill so we fought that for seven years and then uh, so we 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 look around for things where we can expose corruption we we found that nuclear it is operated by Constellation First Entity primarily. Those are the operating uh, corporations for the nuclear in America. And they have engaged, and everybody knows nuclear has got a bad, bad reputation, uh, going back to Three Mile Island and then later because of Chernobyl. 
So they, they're not going to be able to build really any more plants in America, not for the foreseeable future. We've got, I think, 54 in America right now. Uh, they have they, they decided to play the, the left card by uh, by saying they're going to decarbonize American society, which means getting rid of oil and natural gas, which is ridiculous on the face of it because this country was built on oil and natural gas. But they, 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 they're they playing the only card they have, which is to try to gain the approbation of the left by funding a lot of left-wing causes, especially Black Lives Matter, which, of course, has been anti-Israel and pro-Hamas uh, and has been very, very upfront about it. So Constellation uh, has blood on its hands. First Energy has blood on its hands because they're sm- supporting a, a American uh, uh, left-wing concern, which is supporting the terrorists, uh, the, the Hamas terrorists uh, in the Middle East. Uh, so we've been trying to put sunlight on this. They're, they're also very corrupt. They've already been nailed bribing local officials in Ohio and in Illinois, and I'm sure that other states will, will, will emerge. They're also involved in uh, bribes uh, by uh, these two corporations. You, you said you're trying to shine light on this, much-needed light, in my opinion. Are, are you getting anywhere? Have politicians turned eyes toward what you're reporting? How to, you know, that's a great question. You know, politicians are always the last to wake up to reality. They're always trying to say, you know, it's, it's a, typically they say, I have to catch up to the parade so I can lead it, right? <laughs> they're, always, they're always late on everything. So we've been getting a lot of grassroots support. We've been, I've been doing a lot of interviews at the grassroots and getting a lot of uh, hosannas and, you know, uh, pats on the back and stuff like that. We haven't gotten anything uh, political. Uh, in fact, it's just been the opposite because they're, they're tied in with the corrupt Biden administration. They got billions uh, in, uh, in subsidies from the uh, so-called Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, so they're tied in with the corrupt ad- administration. So uh, I'm getting, you know, we're getting conservative attention beginning. We just started this campaign, by the way. We just started this about two or three months ago. Uh, so we're getting good conservative media, but uh, as far as the mainstream media, it's not mainstream media, the left-wing media. They're not mainstream, they're left-wing. Right. Uh, uh, and from uh, left-wing politicians, uh, le- not so much, or not at all, actually. But again, we've only started it. But what we hope to do is at least embarrass them for their, uh, for their stupid uh, support for giving uh, uh, these subsidies to these uh, two corrupt corporations. Very good. Very good. I, I, and, and I hope you keep pushing at it. It's, it's a very important story. And it's a little bit shocking that it, it's, it hasn't blown up immediately. But I understand what you're saying. People are slow to the punch, especially politicians. Yes. One, one of the other reasons I wanted to chat with you today is that you are a, the, the premier Reagan biographer, right? It, oh, you, you, honestly, right, thank you. you have so many books, um, best-selling books, New York Times best-selling books, which is amazing considering that... Um, you have conservative roots too. So uh, that speaks highly of your work. And because of your uh, info and your knowledge of the Reagan years, compare and contrast the the what's what's going on now, right? With, with this presidency. Yes, I know, because there is no comparison, right? But when you say something uh, that I've said before, but I'll say it again, is Joe Biden couldn't hold Ronald Reagan's jockstrap. Oh, gosh. I'm sorry. He's comparing uh, a Wenzel amoeba to a a very sophisticated uh, life form. There's just no comparison whatsoever. Uh, Ronald Reagan was successful at everything before, during, and after his presidency. He, He won the Cold War. He defeated inflation. He defeated high interest. He, he, he restored American morale. He created, uh, you know, 1822 million jobs. He created many, many, many dozens of millionaires in America. The number of millionaires went up by, uh, by you know, thousands. Uh, not, I don't know what percentage it went from. There were, believe it or not, there were only 4,000 millionaires in America in 1980. But by the time Reagan left office, there were over 40. 40,000 millionaires in America, which is, I mean, astonishing growth. 
Uh, and, and I know some people don't think that's good. I happen to think it's very good to create millionaires. My, my, my personal view is, you know, because guess what? They're productive members of society. They create jobs. They, they pay taxes. They're, they're, you know, it's better than uh, these, these uh, punks on campus protesting for, for the PLO or something. Uh, you know, they contribute to a stable society. And, and, you know, one of the other things that was hugely significant about what Ronald Reagan did was on the day he was inaugurated, the hostages in Iran were released. And, I and- interviewed Bruce Langdon, who was from my book on the 80 campaign. He was then the uh, charge d'affaires uh, at the Iranian embassy in 1979. He was taken hostage, was held by for 444 days before he was released on the day, you're right, you're absolutely right, on the day of the inauguration of Reagan. And I and I asked him. I I I queried him. You know, seven ways to Sunday. And and I finally got the answer I wanted, which was that why did the Ayatollah release the hostages after the Carter presidency? He said, simply put, the Ayatollah Khomeini did not respect Jimmy Carter. He walked all over him for a year, but he was terrified of Ronald Reagan. He was he was terrified that Reagan was going to send in the 82nd Airborne uh, and uh, and wreak havoc on Iran and Tehran to get the hostages back. And Iran, uh, and, and, you know, uh, Reagan, uh, uh, had, everybody knew that he was on, he had a platform of, they, they wouldn't, the, the America would not negotiate for hostages. It was just, that's, that's a death trap. Is that if hostages have to die, they have to die. But we're not going to risk the security of the United States by negotiating with hostages. He tried it once with Iran country, got burned. Uh, that, but that was years later. Um, uh, but so the, the so Bruce Langdon said I, it was, the, the Ayatollah was terrified of Ronald Reagan, and that's why, and he wanted to rub it in Carter's nose, and that's why he released him after Carter left office. <laughs> And, and look at now, under Joe Biden, with the American hostages and Israeli hostages uh, by the terror group Hamas. Do you see this White House being able to convince Hamas, the terrorists, to let go the Americans? Now they're giving them billions of dollars. Now they're giving right. Iran billions of dollars to think it's funneled through to Hamas and uh, Hezbollah. You know, look, everybody knows Iran is conducting this uh, genocidal uh, war against, uh, against Israel. Everybody knows that. And they're fun, funneling. And by the way, they're using also using armaments that Biden stupidly left behind in uh, Afghanistan uh, when he ran like a coward, uh, ran tail out of there. Uh, so, so Biden is is a very good friend of terrorists. He's not a very good friend of uh, hostages or of America. And and his cabinet doesn't seem to be in any position of leadership from strength, as Reagan would say, right? Uh, dealing with Hamas right now or Iran. Inconsequential. They're really inconsequential. You know, they have as much importance in America as as a waiter does at the Palm Restaurant. They really do. I mean, they they, they have no relevance whatsoever. They're just feckless. So you and I are in agreement on that. And the big question is that Joe Biden has a year left, right? So where where will, will this lead with war breaking out in the Middle East and other players looking to get involved, sucking America into the conflict and so forth? Where, where do you see us in the next year, Craig? Worse. It's going to get worse. You know, Newton... Uh, you know, postulated three laws. You know, of course, I mean, we all know that, right? Yes. We learned that in high school physics. Is that object in motion has a tendency to stay in motion, and object uh, in, in, in rest has a tendency to stay in, stay at rest. Of course, the uh, the third, which is for there's a reaction for every uh, for the action for every reaction, uh, is that when Biden Biden is on a downward slide. And there's nothing to stop that motion from continuing downward. He's going to go, keep going downward. He's what, I don't know what approval rate he is. He's, I've seen him at 35%. I guess he, he now Carter reached uh, eight, actually 18%, wow. believe it or not. I mean, he reached, he was actually worse than Richard Nixon, if you can believe that. Wow. When Nixon resigned, he still had 22% of the country supporting him. Uh, in September of 79, Carter actually touched 18%. Uh, which is, is the hardcore base, I would say, of the Democratic Party. I don't know if the hardcore base of the Democratic Party under uh, Biden, but it's probably somewhere between 18 and and 35 percent. 
So he's going to continue downward. The economy stinks. The world situation stinks. Uh, inflation stinks. You know, his, his presidency is a joke. Uh, he, he's, he's a liberal joke. Uh, he's, he's the butt of jokes. You know, all you have to do is watch Gutfeld overnight and, and see what kind of jokes they make about uh, Biden's style. Uh, the man can't find his way out of a room. You know, but but I, I don't want to indict him just for his being a senile old man. I want to I want to indict him for his liberalism, for his liberalism and socialism, collectivism, however you want to characterize it, Maoism, Leninism, uh, anything. Uh, it's all on the left side of the spectrum. It's all different forms of collectivism, and collectivism has failed the world over. It failed in the Soviet Union. It failed in the Warsaw Pact. It failed in Eastern Europe. It's it, it, it's it's fa- it's it, it has failed everywhere it's been tried. By the way, don't say China because they're only politically left-wing. They're free market as far as their economy goes, but they control it. The, the, the socialists, they have, a, they have a perfect oligarchy, which, which they encourage. They got big uh, politicians controlling big, big uh, business. Uh, it, but every place collectivism has been tried, fails, fails. Uh, you know, one thing I want to say too is is that these protesters on American college campuses are the are the are the heirs to Nazism, complete with the anti-Semitism. Look, everybody thinks Nazism was a conservative ideology or a right-wing ideology, which is a lie. Nazism. National Socialism, the state controls the means of production and distribution, was a left-wing ideology. It only got it only got uh, it got it got smeared. Conservatives got smeared falsely with being you know being associated with Nazism. I think it was because of the uh, nationalism. But nationalism can be it was it was prevalent in the Soviet Union too. Uh, is that nationalism is is without is not either conservative or liberal. It's just who's ever in power wants to foment nationalism. So the, the, the Nazi Germany, with with its national socialism and its uh, anti-Semitism, is it makes it the perfect uh, uh, ideological heir, or, or ideological parent, uh, or inspiration to the to the punks marching on American college campuses right now. They are the new Nazis. So looking at the landscape of America right now and the political makeup of the Democrat Party, which, uh, you know, it's basically Marxism that that runs through the Democrat Party and and the faith of America, which has turned more and more secular based on a historical perspective, because this is your area of expertise. Where would America as a republic go in the coming years? Oh, boy. Great question. I hate to give you the answer. Well, I know what but, it is, but we need to hear it. Yeah, Cheryl. Most republics fail in their third century. Yeah. Uh, is it Greece, Rome? France is on its fifth republic, right? Uh, since uh, the Napoleonic era. Uh, England is, uh, since uh, Cromwell has been through, uh, is, is, uh, the Republic, third republics failed. Is that every place in the world Republics always fail, almost always fail in the third century. And I don't see, and we've been on a downward trend now for the last, uh, I'd, I'd say since, uh, since Bush 41. Yeah. Since he, since he broke his, his pledge on taxes, he, he created such doubt in American politicians. That really was the seminal act which created the creeping uh, cynicism in America today and the, the, everything. Our, our culture is, is the, we were never unified as America. That, that's nonsense. We're only unified uh, twice, once after December 7, 1941, and then after September 11, 2001. Uh, but those are the only two times America has ever been unified. Uh, we've always been divided. We were divided in the American Revolution. We were divided in the War of 1812. The Civil War was about our varied divisions. Uh, we were divided over entry into World War I. Uh, three dozen congressmen voted against entry into World War I. Uh, we're divided over the Cold War. We're divided over environmentalism. We're divided over taxes. We're divided over abortion. We're divided over everything. Um, so, but it, so the, 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 it's a myth to say that America has ever been unified. That's just nonsense. But uh, having said that, is that there was still a certain glue 
for American society and culture, which was held by, by we had our commonality. We, you know, as far as breakfast cereals, as far as what, the news we consumed, as far as the newspapers we read, that's all breaking apart now. It's breaking apart for a lot of reasons. The influx of illegals in America, the campaign by the left to, to you know, the, 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 the wokeism, uh, creating uh, gender classes and race classes and uh, transvestite classes. Everybody is now looking at themselves not as an American first, but as their grievance and their 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 grievance issue group. You know, I, I'm I'm a transvestite, or I'm I'm a homosexual, or I'm black, or I'm uh, Oriental or Chinese, or uh, that, that's the way they look. So it's co- contributing to the breakup of our society and culture. So I really do, I really see America in the next probably probably the next forty years breaking up. And, and by the way, the, 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 this has happened before. Is that there, there, there are parts of Oregon that are trying to break away from Oregon right now, three counties, and try to join uh, Idaho. There, 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 there's uh, uh, um, uh, parts of New York City that want to break away from New York City. Staten Island wants to join Florida. There are parts of uh, New England that want to uh, 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 Nantucket Island wanted to break away from Massachusetts and join Florida, is that this has happened before in our history and it's happening even now. And I, I, what I see is that there's going to be, uh, there's going to be a, uh, one, one state is going to make the, this, make the case. One state, Louisiana or, or Florida or, 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 or some state, Oklahoma, Idaho, is going to say, you know what? We're done. We're through. We're breaking. We're, we're no longer a part of the United States. We'll have trade relations. We'll have national defense treaties. We'll have things like that. But we're an independent republic. Uh, America is going to break up into insane America, insane America. And insane America is going to be New England, New York, <laughs> Illinois, and the West Coast. And it'll be balkanized, but that's okay. It, 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 balkanization a lot in the, in the country, in the world before. And then insane America will be the South. Uh, uh, will be Idaho, uh, will be Alaska, and uh, so they will they will operate in a state of equilibrium. equilibrium. They'll have trade relations with each other. We'll have mutual defense treaties with each other. Uh, but I, I, I just see the ideological warfare that's going on in America, the, the, the hatred of the left for conservatives. I mean, and, and that's where the hate is coming from, is that hatred is part of the glue that holds together their ideology. Yes. Uh, is that, the, the, you know, is that it, can't, it can't last forever. It just can't. Can you America, look... I'm, 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 I'm sorry to say, America is not special enough to survive the third century. Can you look at those other countries uh, with republics and find a singular reason or a, a, just a... Just a um, uh, a single factor that led to the demise of those republics. Can it be attributed to any one thing? Everything that's happening in America today happened in those countries, whether it was corruption. Okay. I would say, if, if you said one, one phrase, one word, one idea, I'd say corruption. Okay. Corruption. Is that, uh, is that corruption is more prevalent in the, in the left-wing states, in the, in the collectivist states, because corruption, again, is part of their ideology. Interesting. Corruption, hatred, all those emotions are all part of their ideology. So I, I would say that would be the one, that would be the, 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 the main issue that, which caused the breakup of those, uh, those republics. Okay. Um, let, let's finish on a happier note. Now that we are in agreement, <laughs> America's doomed. That. And <laughs> No, you know, people need to hear the truth on that, uh, if anything, so they can uh, turn into prayer warriors because that's where the solution will come. But uh, let, let's just finish up with your book, your latest book. Talk about what you have coming out. Um, and, and I know you are a prolific author. So if you want to talk about the next couple books you have coming out, go right ahead. Um, the, the next book, Cheryl, the next book, which comes out in February, is called The Search for Reagan. 
and it's all about uh, the uh, intellectualism about Ronald Reagan. I, the, the subtitle says appealing intellectual conservatism, which I think is redundant. Conservatism to me is intellectualism. Uh, it doesn't. You don't need to. You don't need to modify it by saying uh, you know uh, intellectual conservatism. But that's you know how you know how publishing house uh, <laughs> they make the final decision. We don't. Yes. Um, you probably run up that many times yourself. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it, so. <laughs> But it is about, I go right at every issue that Reagan has ever been hit on, whether it was his support for uh, the lies about him and Tip O'Neill, which was, they weren't best friends, they were mortal enemies, uh, the, the uh, AIDS, which he was far more understanding, compassionate, and kind than he's ever been given credit for. It's a, it's a lie uh, agreed upon, you know, as Napoleon once said. Uh, is, uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, Japanese reparations for the for uh, Japanese internment program uh, is that I go after every issue that the left has tried to ever hit Reagan on, and I refute every one of their arguments on on AIDS, on homosexuality, on uh, uh, on, on all these uh, you know Martin Luther King holiday, all these issues, all these issues that I refute everything the left has ever charged them with. That's how in fe- and I get February. Into his thinking and his heart and his conscience and his soul. I try to really get into the, the nub of the man beyond just the history of, you know, dates and places, uh, but also about his his enormous kindness and compassion. What a really, truly, truly good man this was. He was not only an extremely bright man. Uh, his one aide, Marty Anderson, who's now passed away, but he was very, very close to Reagan. He told me once he estimated Reagan's IQ at being 175, yeah. which, you know, if anybody would know, it'd be Marty because he had undergraduate and PhDs from uh, Yale and from uh, from uh, Dartmouth and uh, MIT. So he had he had uh, degrees up the yin yang. He, he was a true intellectual, and he would he would recognize another intellectual. Uh, so I, I get into all this with uh, Reagan. I try to do something that's never been done before, which is really get into uh, to, to open the man up and look and, and look at him and look at the, what a superior uh, individual this man was. It's going to be a great book because the left loves to to this day to paint Ronald Reagan as this doddering old fool, practically drooling from the White House office and after. It was more right. It was just an article in the New York Times about uh, the Iran, about the hostage crisis. It was written by Peter, Bra- Peter Baker of the New York Times. Who, he, he, he wrote an article based on one Democratic source, just one source. Wow. And that's how stupid he was as a reporter. That's what a moron he was. And he, he, he wrote, this, the, the, the guy charged that he and then Governor John Conley walked, went around the, the Middle East all summer of 76, 1980, and leaned on local on, on, uh, Arab leaders in Saudi Arabia and in uh, Lebanon and Jordan and others. They went, it was a bank shot. They leaned on them to lean on the Ayatollah to hold the hostages in Iran until uh, so it was removed. Uh, any, any advantage Carter might get, they were released during the fall campaign, which is what Carter was aiming to do. Carter's the one who politicized the hostages, not Reagan. Uh, it, but he wrote this, st- it was a front page story. It was in the New York Times with a single source, Ben Barnes, who was a longtime Democratic uh, operative down in, uh, down in uh, Texas, who has a reputation really kind of uneven and uh, almost borderline nuts. Uh, but, 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 but Peter Baker wrote a whole story, and I, I of course, wrote a piece refuting it completely. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry that I embarrassed Peter by proving what a, what a fool he was, but so be it. <laughs> All right. The, the search for Reagan out in February, February. I assume people can pre-order it now on Amazon. Yes, it's on Amazon right now. All right. Craig Shirley, it's always a delight to have you because you're so outspoken and you tell things like they are. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you like Bold and Blunt, don't forget, you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app, at Real Life Network, at WashingtonTimes.com, where you may also subscribe to my three times a week newsletter and anywhere podcasts are offered. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time. And meanwhile, don't forget, stay blunt, stay bold.